So I'm going to ask a, just three questions, I think, or four questions, one for each, um, and then uh, open it up to the floor to, to also ask questions. Um, and I'm going to, uh, first of all, um, well, I'll just I'll start. And I'm going to start with Paul. Can, it, it, what is the, sort of the five? You have a list in your book of 12 sort of things that can be done for, for a, in a yard to improve a yard and to improve the health of the soil and to, to sequester carbon and to benefit. If, if you were to recommend, besides putting compost down, what would be the next you know, five things you'd recommend? OK, five things really quickly. Uh, number one, water once a week instead of every day. Water very deeply and do it in the morning. How do you know if you have it deeply enough? Get a shovel out, dig down six, eight, ten inches deep and see if the, the soil is wet down there at the bottom. If it's not, water some more. That's all. What you want to teach is the roots to go down to get a drink instead of hanging around by the surface for the sprinkler system to come on. So watering. How far down? You want, it, you want to go six to ten inches down. You want it wet th that deep. So again, that, that, will, that will be wet down there the surface will dry off, so what are the roots going to do? The roots are going to learn to go down for a drink instead of hanging around by the top. Number one, watering. Okay, number two, raise the mower blade. Raise the mower blade from two inches or three inches to four inches. We did a study with the University of Maryland, and you get 95% fewer weeds by if you mow it four inches instead of two and a half or three. So, number one, so that's number two. Number three, sharpen your mower blade. Every eight hours of use, you should have a sharp mower blade. I have two, I keep two mower blades around. Believe it or not, that one thing, if you have a dull blade, it tears the grass instead of cutting the grass. So do that. We already talked about compost. So don't think, number one, the, probably going back to number one, don't think of going organic as a product for product swap. It's a, if you've been on the chemical program for a very long time, the four-step plan that they sell you with Scott's, Going organic, I, start, I call it a 12-step plan, and the first one is mental detoxification. Some of you will get that joke later, okay? It's a different system. It's a natural nutrient cycling system that you've heard about all day. It's no different than the agricultural system. Uh, and, you, and we already talked about putting down compost. What does that mean? Top dressing with about an eighth to a quarter inch of compost over the whole lawn if you can afford it, or anywhere that you want to go. And I guess a message about soil, Soil has the exact same needs that we do as people. The soil organisms, the soil organisms need to eat, and drink, and breathe. And they digest their food and excrete their food. So if you walk all over your lawn, or you drive all over your lawn, you park the Winnebago on it, the soil can't eat, drink, and breathe. And you're going to get weeds like plantain that like to grow in compacted soil, and you're not going to grow grass. Every weed is a messenger sent by Mother Nature to tell us something about the soil. Weeds are symptoms. So we can kill the weed any number of ways. We can burn it, we can spray it, we can flame it. God forbid we bend over and pick it up and eat it, right? <laughs> but the fact is those weeds will keep coming back until you change the underlying soil conditions. And I wanted to end by saying that this shirt choice was very intentional. This is Johnny Selected Seeds from my great state of Maine. They have vowed, taken the safe seed pledge, they do not knowingly sell any GMO material. Their primary customers are market farmers, but they also sell to avid home gardeners. So I don't get any money for saying that. But again, I'm very proud of Maine, very proud of the company. They've been around for 45 years. So johnnyselectedseeds.com. Johnny's. Johnny'sselectedseeds.com. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, we could go on or organic lawn care talk. Get, get his book. It's, yeah. a, it's a wonderful. Or, it's a, or come see me afterwards. OK. <laughs> Ling, um, I've been told that parks departments and highway departments are some of the biggest obstacles to dealing with counties and cities changing their, their pesticide practices. How do you handle that? Well, that's very true because they are stuck. They've learned a certain way and they don't, there's, there's a, a energy they need to do to learn a different method. And so that, you know, activation energy just sometimes is not there. Um, but, you know, parks, that's why we went through our legislators and we didn't go through our parks. Um, but, you know, parks came along um, and now Montgomery County Parks playgrounds are completely pesticide free. 
and uh, the green areas in the parks are pesticide free. So they are now working on the um, playing fields. Yes, they're still working on the playing fields, so. Betsy, um, agriculture is a big crop. It's you know second to to, to lawns in uh, Maryland, as we've heard. Um, but uh, how do agriculture and the Bay sort of mass? I mean, if we're, we're, we're if your organization has an organization called Fair Farms, how is promoting agriculture in Maryland helping the Chesapeake Bay? Thanks, Todd. Actually, you know, the main reason that we have a waterkeeper organization working on farming issues is because it's all about technique. Um, and so getting agriculture is number one pollution source in in the Chesapeake region, throughout Maryland, et cetera. So getting at addressing that problem is thinking about how we're dealing with the food system and can we make the food system part of the solution when, rather than part of the problem and it can be part of the solution for water quality as well as carbon so things like healthy soils are really perfect in that they address every part of this bigger problem within the food system that they provide carbon sequestration. When you have a healthy soil, you're keeping that nitrogen and phosphorus and sediment within the soil. Those are the pollutants in the waterway. So all of those stay within the soil, and then that nitrogen and phosphorus is also captured and used by those plants. And so you get more nutritious plants and crops directly from those soils. And so it's being used instead of running off and into our waterways and polluting them. And you have, in order to have a healthy soil program, you're going to have to have polycultural systems. You can't just have rows and rows of corn because that can only exist where you're spraying the nasty chemicals and stuff on it. So just by virtue of having that kind of system, you're going to have more diverse crops, which means more food for humans um, and better habitat for uh, the various critters as well. So it's a win in every, in every way. Um, and this question is going to be for, for, actually, all of you will have an opportunity to answer it. But it, when I was talking to Alexis about this panel, um, I, I asked her, you know, what made her passionate about this? You know, this type of work um, is, is a lot, is tireless work in sort of educating folks, working with communities, um, networking. And I was, I'd be curious for her to tell us what um, sort of inspired her, or why are you doing what you're doing? And, Everybody else can answer that if they'd like to, too. Well, I'd like to hear your stories, too, but um, it may be similar to mine. You, you may have contemplated climate change and started to have an anxiety that ate up your core, um, imagining the end of civilization and perhaps life on the planet due to human stupidity. And, um, and then you might have started to, to think like a prepper, like, I've got to get out to the country and start growing my own food or... Um, stockpiling the things that I need for my family, you, you start to, you know, once you have that horrible fear, you, you start to have really selfish thoughts about how am I going to survive. Um, maybe you guys aren't as bad as me, but, but that's, you know, that's kind of a, it couldn't be that uncommon. Um, and, and then at, at the same time, I started to learn about organic farming as a solution to climate change. Initially, Organic Consumers Association promoted organic agriculture as a way to reduce the emissions associated with agriculture, because those emissions are huge. It's 57% it's of all global greenhouse gas emissions by some estimates. It's a huge amount of greenhouse gases that are coming from our food system. And so initially we just said, well, if you grow things organically, you don't have those emissions. If you do it organic and local, that takes care of the problem. You don't have emissions related to agriculture. And then we realized that actually, if you start farming organically because of biodiversity, because of everything that you're doing to improve the soil, you're actually a, a carbon sink. And I learned that first from the Rodell Institute from Tim LaSalle while he was the executive director there. And now they, of course, have Chris Nichols to, to spread this word. So it, 
that panic became a sense of of hope and also the you know we aren't that far from preppers in a sense you know when we think about like we're going to start growing our own food and we're we're going to make sure that we're we're safe and and sound even as climate change happens. Um, but there are a lot of community movements that are unlike preppers, unlike that selfish feeling. How about we do this, instead of doing this as a family, let's do it as a community. And I became very inspired by the Transition Network. Has anybody heard of Transition? Anybody seen the movie Tomorrow? So there, this, here's another assignment. After you contact your state legislature, or state legislators about the, the Hawaii carbon farming tax credit, then please go treat yourself to the movie tomorrow. It's a fantastic movie that highlights the transition movement and all of these amazing community solutions. So rather than going off and figuring out how we're going to survive as families or individuals, we, we get together as a community, we create community-based solutions that, that come from a permaculture philosophy, um, just like what they're doing at Forested. Um, but we, we figure out how to create resilient communities and then scale that up. They suggest like getting together with your neighbors on Nextdoor. Does anybody use Nextdoor? Yeah. So if you don't use Nextdoor yet, it's a great way to to talk to your neighbors because they're going to say, "Who do you recommend for lawn care?" And immediately I said, "My lawn service. They are doing organic lawn care service for me. They put compost down, and we have a lot. We have a lawn in the backyard where there never was one under the trees. It's amazing. Once you compost your yard, you're going to have the best results. So you can like." to sneak in these things and you, then you can get more radical and tell your neighbors, hey, I'm working on this pesticide ban, are you in? So there, we, we have to get together as a community. It's too scary to face climate change by ourselves. I'll be brief, I'll be brief. Um, uh, I'm at base an, an environmental attorney and as we heard in a previous speech, um, Agriculture is pretty much not regulated under the Clean Water Act. And so looking at that, it was kind of a, well, what the heck are we going to do about this? Um, I can either say, I'm going to work on these other issues and just kind of leave that over here, or jump right in. And I guess I like a challenge. Um, and decided to jump right in and deal with our biggest pollution source without a whole lot of laws to help us. So you have to get creative on trying to figure out how to address pollution from agriculture and really deal with this bigger systemic food network. And again, it's a voluntary system, so you have to convince people they want to do it. How do you do that? Um, figure out the ways that it's better as a whole. And so it's been a really interesting journey working with a lot of great, inspiring farmers and leaders to show it doesn't have to be done in a way that pollutes and poisons and hurts. You can do things in a really great, new, inspiring way that helps save the world at the same time. Um, I have a good story? Okay, you have to tell me what it is. Um, why did I get into this? Uh, and I'll try to be brief. It's, it can be a long, circuitous story, but it has to do with human health. In, I was a professional landscaper, so I waded through weed and feed for hours and hours and hours for months at a time applying this stuff. And I got something called acute chemical sensitivity, put myself in the hospital, and ultimately sold my lawn care business. But what really got me was my son. My son has, uh, was diagnosed at a very young age with the worst case of ADHD that any of the doctors in Maine had seen at the time. And my older daughter, I was a newspaper reporter at that time, and she was very healthy. She's a physician now and never had any of those same issues. So we were trying to figure out what got my son. Was there any kind of environmental exposure? Why, why was he having these issues? And so the doctor came back around to me and said, well, let's talk about what you were doing at the moment of conception. And I said, well, isn't that rather obvious? And he said, no, wise guy. <laughs> he said, what were you doing for work? And so in April of 1993, when he would have been conceived, I realized that that's peak dandelion spraying season. That's, that's weed and feed season. And, I, and literally from the moment of conception. And then when he was a year old, I would, he would, 
he was a little toddler meeting me at the door and I'd be caked from the knees down in pesticides and I'd play with him at lunchtime and I'd play with him at dinner time and I'd feed him and I'd bathe him and only then would I take my clothes off and shower myself before I went to bed. And so the mere suggestion that what I might have been doing to, might have poisoned my son. Now, this, the, of course, people watching this will say, well, you have no proof that you made your son sick. But the mere suggestion that I made myself sick turned me into a full-blown activist. That was the biggest kick in the gut I ever got in my life. And I've been raising hell ever since and wound up here. So, thanks. Uh, my son, uh, you know, he's doing OK. We'll just leave it at that. Thanks. I think we have five minutes for, for questions. Uh, we're really over time. I see one way in the back, so I'm going to take this to the back. Two questions, uh, first for Lynn and the second one for anyone who can answer. Lynn, you mentioned that you had a neighbor who used pesticides or something. And I'm, so I'm curious uh, what you did um, with about that. Like how did you engage your neighbor, if at all? Um, and then the second question is, okay, let's assume we can get our neighbors to stop using Roundup. Um, what answer can I give them when they say, well, what do I do with all the Roundup that's still in my house, in my garage? So what can we do with that? Thank you for that question. Well, uh, my neighbor happened to be the uh, president of the HOA, <laughs> and I had tried to, I'd gone to the HOA many times to try to uh, convince them. I brought the scientific reports, I brought the health studies, you know, and, and they would not budge. So I was like, well, this is fruitless. I'm going to go to the county. <laughs> so at the county level, your local lawmakers are more inclined to listen to you and they are more inclined to want to do what the constituents are pushing them to do. Whereas uh, HOA presidents, your neighbors, they don't have to do anything. They can just ignore you and you know, but if you really, uh, and so if you cannot find uh, movement that way, then, then yes, go to your lawmakers. Because even if you don't change laws, you can make a complaint and they can look into it and, and try to help you through that way. I'm sorry, what was the other part of the question? Oh, well, so in Montgomery County, you, I mean, you don't have to use it up because you have it. <laughs> um, there is a recycle center that takes toxic stuff. So you can just take it to your recycle center and ask where they take the toxic materials. It is considered hazardous materials. You can't just put it in the trash. Or dump it down the drain. Please don't do that. Hi, uh, my name is Emily Amon, and so I wanted to um, address something that's been brought up multiple times today, um, which is also something that uh, Betsy just brought up now, which is this question of, okay, all of us in the room, we understand that we need to transition uh, the farms from conventional uh, agriculture, uh, which of course is very pesticide, driven and it's not uh, capturing carbon and it's not holding water, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to transition to agroecology, uh, to permaculture, et cetera. So I wanted to put it out there and I did already tell Chris from Rodale that I actually specifically did my graduate capstone research um, to create a toolkit uh, on how to transition to agroecology. And that it was done, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, so this was done as a research partnership with the Rural Coalition and National Family Farm Coalition because their um, farmer uh, members had asked for this type of research. And so again, it's a toolkit that is specifically designed with farmers um, in mind as the main 
readers and it has background on agroecology and then it discusses how you can either start as a new farmer doing agroecology or how you can transition from conventional to agroecological farming. And it's a combination of um, literature review as well as uh, doing a hands-on interview with a farmer from Frederick, Maryland, who did transition his land from conventional to certified naturally grown. Yes, it is online and um, I can share later the link. Uh, so it's at fair, farmbillfairness.org and farmbillfairness, farmbillfairness.org and you'll have to find um, from like the specific year. So if you type in on Google probably farmbillfairness.org and then agroecology toolkit, um, likely my research will come up. It's all of the graduate research for each of the years that American University has done a farm bill practicum, partnering with Rural Coalition and National Family Farm Coalition. There's actually lots of incredible research from all the various topics that you will prob probably all be interested in. But if you want the agroecology toolkit specifically, put that in the search. Sure. Um, I have wanted for uh, years to um, to compost. I, I'm an avid recycler, but I uh, want to, uh, if possible, have no trash. I mean, nothing going to a landfill. Um, so, but I have very little land. I have four trees, um, so they're leaves that fall on the pavement. So a huge number of leaves, and I want to. Uh, I'm a vegan, so I, but I, you know, I have. Uh, a lot of peels from fruits and vegetables. So um, is it okay to use a metal composter? Uh, there are some online places that sell these ones that they're ba like a, ba a barrel on its side and you can roll it and they'll work? Okay. And can you keep them, can you keep them in, in, in a garage? Okay, okay, thank you. And then the, sorry. Those composting things that you're talking about that you roll like that, they're really fun because they keep the new stuff on the outside and then the inside will fill up with something that looks like rich black soil. I had one that was plastic, it was I think Sunmar that I loved. And now I just do, a, you know, I've got a bigger yard so I just have a pile that I turn and stuff. But, but that is that's really great. And if you have a small amount of, of space, it's okay. It doesn't take up a whole lot of room. And you'll create enough compost to, to um, pot little plants. You know, you can pot house plants or whatever, but that's a great thing to do. Well, a round of applause for the panel.